It was on July 6, 1902, that a young Catholic girl in Italy died in defense of the virtue of chastity, just as the virgins of the early Christian era died in defense of their chastity, besides dying in defense of the holy faith. Maria Goretti is a name that became as famous as the name of St. Agnes wherever her heroic action became known. Here in the United States she became well known especially in the late 1940s and in the years that followed because of her beatification and canonization by Pope Pius XII. It was on July 5th in the year 1902 that a young farm worker named Alessandro Serenelli, driven insane by passion, attempted to force Maria Goretti to give up her virtue of chastity, but she absolutely refused to cooperate in any way, as every girl or woman is obliged to refuse in such a case. And she fought off her attacker with all her physical strength, just as every girl or woman is obliged to do, no matter what the threat may be. Filled with savage fury because of Maria's absolute refusal and heroic resistance, Alessandro took hold of a dagger which he had brought up from the cellar beforehand, and he stabbed the girl over and over again, fourteen times in all, leaving her apparently dead on the kitchen floor. July 5, <coughs> 1902, was a Saturday. It was mid-afternoon. Maria's mother was outside a short distance from the house, helping with the thrashing at the time of the criminal attack. The noise of the thrashing made it uh, difficult to hear any cry for help coming from the house, though Maria did really cry out for help, but it wasn't loud enough. If she had been able to cry out more loudly, she could have been heard by Alessandro's father, who was sleeping outside next to the house. He had been helping with the threshing also, but he was not feeling well, so he went off to rest up a bit. Alessandro himself was helping with the threshing of the grain too, but he somehow managed to sneak away and go to the house with some excuse or other, though in his mind he had an evil design all the while. Having failed on two other occasions to persuade Maria to sin, he now figured he had the chance for which he was looking for so long, and this time he would not stand for any refusal. Maria's mother first sensed that something was wrong when the cry of her baby girl broke through the noise of the threshing. Maria herself had been watching the baby and was doing some sewing at the same time when Alessandro made his wicked demands upon her. The absence of Maria, who had been pulled away into the kitchen, caused the baby to cry very loudly. Maria's mother hurried off to the house, and to her horror and intense grief found her daughter lying on the kitchen floor, but not yet dead. She excitedly asked her daughter what happened, and who did it, and how. Maria answered clearly that it was Alessandro. He wanted me to do wrong, and I would not, she said to her mother, who then fell over unconscious and was carried away, though she later recovered consciousness. The wife of one of the workers, all of whom had come running to the house, also questioned Maria and heard her say, He wanted me to commit an ugly sin, and I told him, No, no, no. Later on, more of her words at the time of the attack were learned. When Alessandro threatened her, she protested, What are you doing, Alessandro? Do not touch me. It is a sin. You will go to hell. These words show <coughs> that she had God foremost in her mind. It would be a sin, an offense against God, to commit the sin of impurity demanded by the wicked boy. And she knew that the divine punishment for such sins is eternal hell fire. She preferred death to sin. Maria did not die until about 24 hours later. Towards evening on that fateful Saturday, she was taken by ambulance to the Natuno Hospital. Natuno, which is southeast of Rome, along the Mediterranean seacoast, 
is a name well known to those who remember the landing of American troops in that area, and especially near Anzio during World War II. At the Natuno Hospital, which was under the direction of the Little Sisters of the Poor, Maria was taken to the operating room, but only after the chaplain of the hospital named Padre Martino gave the dying girl a chance to go to confession to him. <coughs> the operation was, of course, unsuccessful, and the doctors quickly saw that there was nothing they could do to save the girl's life. One of the fourteen dagger wounds was actually in the heart, though not right through the center of the heart. Maria bore her sufferings with remarkable superhuman courage and patience. Her mother, whose name was Asunta, in honor of Mary's, uh, Mary assumed into heaven, was with her daughter for part of the night, but she was not permitted to stay all night. This was an extra heavy cross for both the daughter and the mother. Maria saw how her mother was suffering, and she did not want to add to that suffering by speaking to her of her own agonizing pain. Her mother would ask her every now and then, as she had done frequently during the ambulance ride to the hospital, if she was in pain. But Maria would invariably say, No, Mama, I am quite all right, or something similar to that. Maria was suffering intensely from thirst, and she asked for some water before the operation and later on in her hospital bed. But because of her condition, they told her that they could not give her even one drop of water. Maria accepted this with patience. She also wanted to see her little brothers and sisters, but her request could not be granted, and again she resigned herself to the will of God. And she even thought of her father and mentioned his name, but he had died of malaria fever a couple of years or so before, and she realized that she caused pain to her mother, who keenly felt the loss of her beloved husband, Luigi Garetti, and she felt sorry for mentioning his name to her. She thought so little of her own sufferings and constantly thought of the pain she may be causing her mother. As her mother was leaving for the night, Maria worried where uh, she would sleep, but her mother simply said, God will provide. Actually, Asunta spent the night in the ambulance which had brought Maria to the hospital. When her mother left the room, Maria's eyes turned to the picture of Our Lady, the Madonna, as she called her and as all Italians call her, and which means My Lady, literally. It was a large picture that was hanging on the wall. Her mother had taught her great devotion to Mary, and she often looked up at that picture on the wall. To the sister attending her, she said, The Madonna is waiting for me. Maria was overjoyed when the hospital chaplain, Padre Martino, asked her the next morning if she would like to become a child of Mary that is, a member of the confraternity of the children of Mary. The Padre placed the blue ribbon with the medal of Our Lady around Maria's neck, and she repeatedly kissed the medal. Maria's parish priest, Father Signori, spent the night in Maria's room, prepared to assist her in her last moments. But his main purpose was to give her Holy Communion and to anoint her. He had just given her her first Holy Communion the previous May 29th, hardly more than a month before. Now he would give her her last Holy Communion, which would actually be the young girl's sixth Holy Communion. However, Father Signori had a very important question to ask Maria before giving her Holy Communion, and he hesitated somewhat not knowing just how to word the question and fearing that he might upset the dying girl who was already in so much pain. But he began the questioning, whispering to her that our Lord would be coming to her very soon. And the Padre continued with these words, 
Remember, my child, how he died upon the cross, how he forgave everyone, and showed particularly particular mercy to the penitent thief with a generous promise, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And you, Maria, do you forgive your murderer with all your heart? Without a moment's hesitation, Maria replied, Yes, I too, for the love of Jesus, forgive him, and I want him to be with me in paradise. And as if this were not already enough, she added, May God forgive him, because I have already forgiven him. Maria had made <coughs> the heroic act of defending her purity in the face of death, and now she made the heroic act of charity in forgiving her attacker and murderer. The sister lit the candles for Holy Communion. The room was adorned as for a feast. Two of the sisters and a noble lady had seen to this beforehand. Flowers were scattered even over Maria's bed. All this was a sign of veneration for one who was considered a martyr. The story of Maria's martyrdom had spread rapidly among the people who acclaimed her a martyr and a saint. Maria was not aware of the veneration she was receiving. Brother Meinlad, the pharmacist at the Natuno Hospital, had come to her bed and he indicated his reverence for her as for one who would soon be in heaven and would be able to intercede for him before the throne of God. Maria, he said, remember me up in heaven. And the girl, as if completely forgetting her own condition, said to him, who knows which one of us will get there first. The brother told her, you will. All right, Maria replied, if that is true, then I will remember you. After Maria received Holy Communion and extreme unction also, all indications of pain seemed to leave her face for a while. This was her union with Jesus that was to be eternal. She received her first Holy Communion on Sunday, May 29, 1902, and now she received her last Holy Communion on Sunday, July 6. Maria's mother, Assunta Goretti, was not present for the Holy Communion, which would have edified and consoled her so much. She was outside, sitting on a stone bench in front of the hospital, already since dawn, waiting to be allowed to come in. While she was sitting there, a couple of men walked by talking about someone who had just died. Asunta did not hear the name of the one who died, and she immediately concluded that it must have been her Maria. As a result, she fainted. When she came to a few minutes later, the men assured her that they were not talking about Maria. Asunta was allowed to come into the hospital before the regular opening time. Maria, who had been looking longingly at her bedroom door, hoping that she would see her mother walk in, and when she finally did see her walk in, she was very happy. During the last hours of Maria's life, her mother had the difficult task of questioning her in the name of the chief of police. The big question was whether Alessandro had ever threatened her before July 5th. Maria said, yes, Mama, twice, for the first time about a month ago. Her mother was dumbfounded that she did not say anything about this, but Maria said that she was ashamed and did not know how to tell her mother. And besides, Maria said, Alessandro swore he would kill her if she said one word about it to her mother. And then Maria added, but now he has killed me anyway. Her mother asked her if she screamed for help, and she said she did as long as she could, and then Alessandro left her alone. Among the last things that Assunta said to Maria, whose strength was fast failing in the early hours of the afternoon of July 6th with ease. Pray for us. Forgive everyone. Commend yourself to our Lord. 
Maria gradually lost consciousness and went into a partial coma during which she lived the horrible ordeal of 24 hours ago. She repeated some of the words which she had said to Alessandro during the attack. Her mother now heard her say with a strange sound in her voice, What are you doing, Alessandro? You will go to hell. Just as she had said after the attack, so now in her last moments, Maria once again pleaded, Carry me to bed, carry me to bed, because I want to be nearer to the Madonna. Now Asunta knew <coughs> as if she had actually been there what her daughter had said during and after the attack of the day before. Asunta heard a clock down the hospital corridor strike three. It was not long after that that Maria, in her half-coma, desperately grasped the arm of the sister watching beside her bed as if to seek help and protection from some threatening evil and then she fell back onto her pillow and lay quiet her pure angelic soul winged its way into the realms of never-ending glory where as saint john writes in the apocalypse and god will wipe away every tear and death shall be no more Neither shall, be, uh, shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. It was mid-afternoon, Sunday, July 6, 1902. Maria Goretti was 11 years, 8 months, and 20 days old. She had been born on October the 16th, 1890. There was a tremendous turnout for Maria's funeral. Church dignitaries public officials, religious organizations, people from all walks of life, from towns and cities and from the country, and also vacationers and tourists who had come to the resort areas around Netuno and Anzio. Business places were closed for the funeral and people had flowers and decorations at their windows as the long funeral procession went by. But the anti-clericals and socialists were furious because Maria Goretti was being acclaimed as a martyr in defense of purity and as the pride of modern Italy and as a model for the youth of the world. They were the very ones who went to the defense of Alessandro Serenelli and excused, excused his crime. But no one could take away the glory of virginity and martyrdom that Maria Goretti merited before God. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints, exclaimed the psalmist in Psalm 115. If the death of the saints is not precious in the eyes of the wicked, that takes nothing away from the glory of the saints, but rather makes it stand out all the more. The Most High saw to it that Maria Goretti would be glorified by the Church at a time chosen by His infinite wisdom, a time when her example of heroic purity and modesty would be badly needed among men. That time came in the years that followed World War II, when material devastation was to be seen everywhere in many of the European countries and in so many places elsewhere in the world. And far worse than that, when moral deterioration began to accelerate at an appalling rate, despite the fact of an apparent religious revival that did not, however, have deep roots. Maria Goretti was beatified by Pope Pius XII, himself a strong promoter and defender of purity and modesty, on June 24, 1947. Three years later, June 24, 1950, during the Holy Year, the same Holy Father canonized the young girl who had died in defense of her purity nearly 48 years earlier. The canonization ceremony was held outside on its front steps for the first time in history. Although the Basilica can accommodate about 60,000 people, it was much, much too small for the crowd that assembled for the canonization 
of Maria Goretti. It was by far the largest crowd that had ever gathered for such an occasion, and in the eyes of worldlings and those of weak and shallow faith, it was a completely bewildering fact. Another remarkable feature of Maria Goretti's canonization was the presence of her mother, Assunta Goretti, who was then over 80 years old. This was the well-deserved reward that God bestowed upon the woman who trained her daughter to choose death rather than to offend God by sin. Here was a God-fearing woman who did not have to regret that she was unable to provide an abundance of material needs for the benefit of the body, for she lived in great poverty. She had no need to feel sorry for her naturally beautiful daughter because she was unable to provide her with nice clothes and other adornments that girls filled with the love of this world crave so much. She taught her daughter to cherish and safeguard the beauty of the soul in preference to showing off a beautiful face and figure, which can so easily arouse the passion of lust in men and boys, and thus be the cause of their eternal ruin. Pius XII recognized the greatness of Assunta Goretti, who contributed so greatly to the exaltation of her daughter, Saint Maria Goretti. He honored her by having her stand beside him as he blessed the vast throne before St. Peter's Basilica. The Holy Father decreed that the feast of St. Maria Goretti was to be observed by the Universal Church throughout the world on July 6th, the day of her death. Yet we know to our dismay that her feast was not placed on the liturgical calendar in many places and was not observed everywhere from 1951 on. On the day after the canonization of St. Maria Goretti, Pope Pius XII delivered an address, officially called a homily, after the Gospel of the Mass. He began by stating, in the words of St. John Damascene, one of the early fathers of the Church, that virginity makes one live like an angel. And he added uh, that it merits heaven. This, he said, was the life of St. Maria Goretti. More than once did the Holy Father compare St. Maria Goretti to the angels, as others had done long before him already, including Father Signori, who gave the saint her last Holy Communion on the day of her death. The Supreme Pontiff extolled the innocence of soul which the young saint possessed from her earliest years, as well as her diligence in performing her duties at home and thus being of great help to her mother, who experienced such difficulties in making a livelihood for her family, especially after the death of her husband, Luigi. Maria Goretti, as the Holy Father pointed out, did not receive any formal schooling, because the family lived in such poverty, but she received a good basic religious training at home so that she understood well that God was the center of man's life here on earth <coughs> and that our true home is not here on earth but in heaven. She found great joy in going to church, which was seven miles away, but she had to go by foot. Though she knew the basic facts of religion and morals, she did not have a sufficient knowledge of the Catholic religion so as to satisfy the parish priest and be allowed to receive her First Holy Communion at an earlier age. But when she did learn her catechism well enough, she was allowed to approach the table of the Lord, whom she received with such fervor and devotion that, as the Holy Father observed, she seemed like an angel in human flesh. 
Pope Pius XII attributes to her fervent reception of her first Holy Communion, plus a few more Holy Communions before her death, the fact that she possessed such heroic fortitude when she was attacked by a lustful youth and chose to preserve her virginal purity rather than stain it by the foulness of mortal sin. Her Eucharistic Lord was her strength. While the Holy Father stressed the fact that God gave St. Maria Goretti to this modern age as an example, we cannot note, except with great sorrow and dismay, that this immoral and unchaste and immodest and murderous generation has not accepted her as its model and patron, but has by its way of life emphatically rejected her. And this mean that it, it means that it has rejected the grace of God made manifest in her. From their earliest years, young girls have before their eyes the shameful example of their own mothers and of their older sisters who dress immodestly everywhere, even in the most sacred places and on the most sacred occasions. They are taught by this bad example to be an incentive to crude, unchaste thoughts and desires to men and boys whose passions cannot but be fired up at the sights they are forced to see everywhere and at all times. If a wicked youth like Alessandro Serenelli was inflamed with lust at the sight of a chaste and modest girl, because of the fallen nature which he possessed, what must we say of boys and men of today, possessing the same kind of fallen nature, who rarely see a truly modest girl or woman and a true inspiration to chastity? It is no wonder that Jacinta of Fatima has foretold a frightful divine punishment to come for the sins of impurity and of vanity and of excessive luxury that are widespread in the world uh, in the world in which we live. It is no wonder that she also said that most souls who go to hell go there because of sins of the flesh. Among the very common sins of the flesh of our day are sins of impurity in thought and desire and word and action, as well as sins of immodesty in dress, which lead to sins of impurity. The example of St. Maria Goretti can only urge all to repent their sins of the flesh and amend their lives. All must recover without delay that moral sense and that God-given sense of modesty and shame which was so alive in Maria Goretti. It was no accident that Maria Goretti reacted so strongly against the suggestions and threats of Alessandro Serenelli. Just at the time of the young martyr's funeral, there were unbelievers who resented the honors being given her and tried to play down her heroic act and even smear her good name. So also were there atheistic psychiatrists at the time of Maria Goretti's beatification and canonization who tried to make her heroic resistance look like just a purely natural and instinctive act of any girl or woman. But a Catholic psychiatrist correctly explained that a girl or woman will react in the way she has been morally and religiously trained. If, like Maria Goretti, she has a profound moral sense and a deep faith in God, she will resist any attack upon her virtue to her very last breath. If not, then she will likely give in just to save her bodily life. But she will then lose the supernatural life of the soul as a result. 
And if her attacker kills her anyway, she will lose her immortal soul forever. Her obligation is to protect her virtue no matter what the threat may be. St. Maria Goretti has given to this unchaste and immodest generation an example of perfect fulfillment of that obligation. She lost the life of her body by resisting, but she saved her immortal soul thereby, and she merited great glory in the kingdom of heaven. May the Lord bless you and give you peace.